On September 15, 1959, there was a commotion at the Andrews Air Force Base near Washington. The arrival of an official delegation from the USSR was expected. However, while Eisenhower was waiting for Khrushchev, aviation enthusiasts were waiting for his plane. The sky over America was cut with a roar by a huge, long-range turboprop airliner, the face of Soviet aviation. Hello Aviator, Sky here, and today, decades after that iconic flight, we meet this giant again. Welcome to the 2 114. The history of the aircraft, which literally and figuratively raised so much noise, began in the early 1950s. Aviation was undergoing a revolution, gas turbine engines expanded the capabilities of aircraft and they began to claim long distance routes across continents and oceans. The aviation leaders of that time had different needs, but the goals were similar. The de Havilland Comet was already flying in the UK. Large Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8 jet airliners were created in the USA, and in the USSR, 2104 and Il-18 were conquering the sky. However, Soviet planes were limited in range, and to work on the scale of the entire Blue Bowl, a much more serious transport was needed. Appropriate decisions were not long in coming. Already in 1955, when the smaller brothers were just starting their flights, the government issued an assignment to create a large and roomy passenger aircraft capable of non-stop flights over distances that were huge for that time. The assignment was ambitious and very difficult. The matter was taken up by the Design Bureau, which is best versed in heavy and long-range aircraft, the team of Andrei Tupolev. Development of the Izdelia 114 concept began. The initially obvious idea to create an aircraft from scratch, in fact turned out to be far from obvious. Such large-scale work would require serious costs and many years of work, and the deadlines were tight. On the other hand, it was also impossible to simply modify an existing plane. There was simply no such aircraft. Or... Actually, there was, but with a caveat. It was a bomber. The 295 strategic bomber made its first flight in 1952 and had been actively tested for several years. Moreover, it had decent dimensions and range. But it was a bomber. You can't make a passenger plane out of it. Yes, someone will remember the 2116, a direct modification of the 295 with a passenger cabin. But this aircraft was, let's say, very peculiar and was used only as a VIP transport with a capacity of only a couple dozen seats. We are talking about a full-fledged passenger aircraft. The designers nevertheless decided to take the 295 as a base for their main civilian project. But while the 116s got off with a local modification, when creating the 114s, the design was altered very radically. This solution has both pros and cons, some of which we will look at. The most obvious advantage is that the work was carried out at a frantic pace. Engineers quickly implemented the already proven solutions, and the freed-up resources were directed to the development of new solutions. In addition, Project 114 was one of the first when the design bureau worked with Aeroflot, its main customer, from the early stages of implementation, which simplified the work of both and in the future promised to speed up the launch of the planes to the airlines. The work was accelerated by the general authority of Tupolev and the active support of the country's leadership. Khrushchev really wanted this plane and he wanted it as soon as possible. The results didn't take long. The extremely complex project deployed in 1955 reached the stage of a flight prototype by 1957. The main controversial point of the 295 heritage was its power plant. The 2114 became the world's largest passenger turboprop aircraft and, by the way, is still considered to be so. But why would they make a turboprop at the dawn of the jet era? The point is not that the engineers were too lazy to make a jet aircraft, but that there was not much of a choice. Yes, jet power plants were more promising, but those were the 1950s. Nowadays, large turbofan engines are amazing, but at that time they were not powerful enough and more importantly had terrible fuel efficiency and reliability. Considering the urgency of creating the aircraft, the required jet engine was beyond the planning horizon. 
Meanwhile, there was the NK-12 at hand, a 15,000 horsepower monster with a coaxial contra-rotating propellers. Yes, it was terribly noisy, especially when the propeller tips began to break the sound barrier, and the flight speed was limited. But at the same time, the NK-12 remained sufficiently powerful, reliable and economical, which in this case was critical. The 2114 could take off with a failure of one engine, and maintain flight for some time with a failure of two. In addition, being inferior to jet engines in speed, turboprops feel better at low speeds, which gives a bonus to takeoff and landing performance. The 2114 is a large and heavy aircraft, its maximum takeoff weight is as much as 179 tons, and its airfield requirements were quite high. But if it was a jet, I'm afraid there would be few runways in the world from which it could take off. The low speed of aircraft with such a power plant was partially solved on the 295. With the NK-12, the 2114 gained the ability to fly at altitudes up to 12 kilometers and maintain a cruising speed of around 404 knots, with a maximum of 475. A huge number for a machine with a propeller, not really lagging behind its jet counterparts. Meanwhile, the flight range reached 9,000 kilometers, quite enough for most routes. Along with the power plant, the 2114 inherited almost the entire wing from the bomber, with the exception of elements of the center section and enlarged flaps. In total, its span reached 51.1 meters. There are four large engine nacelles on the wing, the NK-12 is a rather big engine. Plus, the nacelles of two engines located closer to the fuselage turn into the fairings of the main landing gear. For Tupolev aircraft at that time, it is quite a classic solution. Since the wing of the aircraft is swept, to create a working space for propellers, the engine nacelles are moved forward quite a lot. This working space had become a challenge for engineers. The fact is that the base 295 had a mid-wing, which made it possible to raise the engines higher. The civilian airliner was supposed to be low wing, but in this layout there was simply nowhere to lower the wing. The 5.5 meter propellers would simply scrape the ground. Tupolev, instead of raising the wing, raised the fuselage. This is the main reason why the 2114 is so tall. This is most noticeable when looking at the landing gear. While the main gear integrated into the wing migrated almost unchanged, the front leg, having risen under the fuselage, stretched for as much as 5 meters. Yes, 16 feet. Now remember what the front legs of other airliners look like, even large ones. By the way, they didn't forget about another small gear in the tail section, which acts as a protective shoe, in case the tail touches the runway. The tail also migrated from the bomber, but again with changes. On the 295, the empennage is cruciform, the horizontal stabilizer is integrated into the base of the fin. On the 2114, the stabilizer went into the tail section, and the design itself was redone to increase the range of balancing and alignment of the aircraft. The tail turret, obviously, wasn't needed either. The main change in the design is the fuselage. The basic fuselage of the 295 was not suitable for carrying passengers. A completely new and much larger version was needed. And here, the lower flight speed gave another bonus. The pipe could be made bigger. There were many options, from the level of jetliners of that time, to huge ones comparable in diameter to modern wide-body planes. They stopped at a diameter of 4.2 meters and a length of 54.1 meters. For the 1950s, this was a lot. Jet airliners of that time, even large ones, had fuselages much narrower and shorter. In fact, the 2114 was the leader in terms of size and weight, until the advent of the Boeing 747. Of course, knowing the record dimensions of the fuselage, it immediately becomes interesting what it has inside. Climbing a tall ladder, we pass through the front door and find ourselves in a small lobby. Here, there are seats for flight attendants, as well as a couple of relatively standard lavatories. To the right of the front door is the pass for passengers to the first cabin. To the left is the pass for the crew to the cockpit. The door to the cockpit is quite miniature and at the same time thick. The reason for this is the possibility of complete hermetic isolation of the cabin in case of an emergency. Next comes the first passenger cabin. 
7 rows standard 3 plus 3 layout. The Tu-114 is still a narrow-body aircraft, but it is the largest in this class, which affects the internal volumes. There is a lot of open space in the cabin, the ceiling is high, and instead of the usual modern luggage racks, here there are open shelves with nets. This further enhances the visual feeling of spaciousness. Plus, the windows are round and quite large, filling the cabin with light. The design is excellent, a lot of fabrics and metals. They were not saving on high quality materials and their mass. Seats without any luxuries, but with curious bonuses. Moving on. The second cabin is close in size, but the decoration here is already much more curious. Instead of standard seats, there are sofas opposite each other, separated by tables. More like a train cabin than an airplane. Sliding tables, multicolored materials, and a lot of wood in the finishing. Everything about it is great, but there are downsides. Exactly four downsides. The cabin is located in the plane of the engine propellers, the noise of which turned into an absolutely thunderous rumble. Illusion partially solved a similar problem of the Il-18 by removing passengers from this part and placing a wardrobe there. But with the dimensions of the Tu-114, they'd had to place not a wardrobe here, but a whole boutique. As a result, they tried not to put passengers in this cabin, using it more often as a restaurant. Okay, we run through this part of the plane, it's too early to look at it, and we find ourselves in another exotic section. In the section behind the wing of the airliner, four rooms are placed, like in a train. Three shelves, a small table, and of course isolation from the rest of the cabin. They could accommodate 12 people with maximum comfort, and if necessary, put 24 people on the lower shelves. A classy solution of its time, a legacy of luxury piston aircraft cabins, which most people saw only in the movies. Considering the trend, an ordinary cabin, a cabin like on a train, rooms like on a train, next we should be finding a whole palace, like on a train. But instead, we meet another quite ordinary passenger cabin. Here again, a classic aviation seats with a slightly different upholstery. Nine rows in a 3 plus 3 layout. But the fun doesn't end there. Next comes a large wardrobe, another lobby with a tail door, and lavatories. The creators of the tail lavatories clearly were not limiting themselves. There are two large rooms. Yes, two. Female and male. Each has two booths, sinks, mirrors, and illuminated tables. Windows were placed in the ceiling for natural light during the day, as well as lamps for illumination at night. From the point of view of the layout of passenger aircraft, of course a wild waste of space, but in terms of appearance and comfort this is luxury, more like the toilets of a restaurant than an airplane. If you think that the exotics are over, then no, it's time for dessert. We return to the section near the wing, between the second cabin and the sleeping compartments. There is a galley here. Thermoses, boilers, sinks, niches for bottles, and shelves for all kinds of tasty little things. There are two large windows in the ceiling. The question immediately arises. Where is the food if there are only bottles, sweets, and boilers in the buffet? Well, the food was cooked in the kitchen, downstairs. The dimensions of the Tu-114 allowed the designers to place additional rooms on the lower deck. Near the buffet, there is a full staircase leading down. Here, there is a rest cabin for the crew, as well as the kitchen where all the food is prepared and sent upstairs to the galley. Trays were lifted in special elevators, while bottles and other small things could be passed through a niche under the stairs. In the first years of operation, even a cook was listed among the crew members. Of course, when looking at all this luxury, a logical question arises. Several classes of service, a restaurant cabin, sleeping compartments, a cook. Isn't it too much pompousy for a Soviet passenger plane? Here, there are several nuances. These were the 1950s, an era of rapid development of aviation, which was in the center of public attention. Each new plane was presented as a flying palace, and the larger it was, the more palatial it was considered. 
The flagships had cabins, bars, restaurants and recreation areas. Soviet aircraft manufacturers were no exceptions to this trend and, in some cases, allowed themselves to play with interior design. Besides, the plane which we are looking at is not quite ordinary. On the exposition of the Aviation Museum in Monina, there is the plane USSR L-5611. Yes, this is the same plane that participated in exhibitions and made many sensational international flights, often carrying high political delegations. In fact, a government plane and demonstrator of achievements could not be ordinary. Because of this, the seating density in a cabin of this size was very modest, only 170 seats. Naturally, not all 114s were like that. Production planes started off with similar layouts, but pretty quickly moved on to regular cabins, accommodating 220 passengers. Not as luxurious, but economically much more efficient. In this regard, we were lucky that the first plane with such a cabin managed to preserve it, both during the period of operation and after decades of storage in the museum. And finally, luggage. Thanks to the location of the kitchen in the lower deck, we are able to get into the luggage compartments through it. There are two compartments in the aircraft. Loading and unloading was carried out through the luggage doors in the tail and no sections of the fuselage. The solution is quite classic, plus access through the lower deck, you could get here during the flight. In the early stages of work, the designers had ideas to leave the vertical loading option, according to the scheme that is used to equip the 295 with weapons. But the idea was abandoned, for civil aviation it was too exotic and fraught with difficulties in operation. Finally, we return to the nose and having passed through the small pressure door, we find ourselves in the cockpit. At first glance, it is clear whose brainchild this is. The layout is very close to other Tupolev civil airliners of that time. A huge number of instruments, large steering wheels, glazing and of course the navigator's cabin in the nose. A kind of upgraded version of the 2104. But given the size of the aircraft, this upgrade strongly affected the dimensions of the cockpit. It is simply huge. The interior space has grown very much. In comparison with it, the workplaces of the pilots of most of its peers felt like the cockpits of Bethesgaffs. The layout for civilian Tupolev airliners is quite familiar and is designed for five people. Two pilots in their places, a flight engineer, a radio operator and a navigator. Moreover, the navigator had an additional function. Due to the very high front leg, the aircraft on the ground raised its nose a little, which diminished visibility for the pilots, so the role of the eyes when taxiing often went to the navigator, who had all the views open. The aircraft made its maiden flight in November 1957 and gave rise to an epic testing story with breaks for various demonstration flights. In 1959, the plane number L-5611, through which we are now walking, took part in a whole world tour. It visited the international exhibition in Brussels and then became the highlight of the Soviet exposition at the Paris Air Show. Then it made its first transatlantic flight, going to New York for an exhibition of achievements of Soviet science, technology and culture. In New York, in 1959. This arrival was a sensation and the services of Idlewild Airport, the current Kennedy Airport, had to sweat. It turned out that they didn't have ladders this high. In demonstrating the success of the aviation industry, the fastest turboprop aircraft in the world, which at the same time was also the largest passenger aircraft in the world, did very well. The second flight to the United States made this aircraft even more famous when, in the autumn of 1959, it brought to Washington the Soviet delegation, led by Nikita Khrushchev. Aeroflot greatly benefited from the close work with the design bureau. The period of accepting the aircraft into the park was minimal, some of the crews mastered the plane at the testing stages and the training was carried out directly at the Tupolev facilities in Kuybyshev, modern Samara, where the 2114 was assembled. This whole team soon became the core of the 206 Vnukova Flight Squadron, flying on a new long-range aircraft. Now 
Regular flights in the USSR began in 1961, and over the next few years aircraft also entered international routes. Especially of course, it is necessary to note the adventures of the Tu-114 in flights to Cuba. The Cuban Missile Crisis was in full swing. The Soviet and American military were waiting for the start of the brightest and shortest war in history. And civil aviators had finally received the tool that allowed them to connect Moscow to Havana. I'll note right away that it wasn't the usual 114s that flew there. The two 114Ds, where D stands for Dalny, long range, were refitted. The number of passengers was reduced to 60, part of the cargo volume gave way to additional fuel tanks, and the takeoff weight reached 182 tons. This gave additional range. Nevertheless, Havana turned out to be almost at the limiting point of the 2114D range, and for safety reasons, options for performing intermediate landings were considered. At first it was about Africa, Guinea, Senegal, Algeria, but it was difficult to work with them. Everyone understood that the airliners were not carrying tourists to Cuba, and given the transport blockade by the United States, each flight became a political issue. In the end, it was decided that it would be better to fly from their own territory. A route from Murmansk was developed. At first glance this route may seem strange. Why fly north to then fly south? But it just so happens that the earth is round, and the path from Murmansk was shorter than from Moscow. Flying across the northern seas, Greenland and along the east coast of North America was adventurous, as was the return trip, just the same, only with some pretty hard takeoffs, with steep climbs at Havana airport in hot and humid conditions. But the task was completed, transport links were established and the airliner successfully flew with passengers and cargo without incident. Another interesting international experience for the Tu-114 was in cooperation with Japan, when in 1967 Aeroflot and Japan Airlines opened a joint Moscow-Tokyo flight. Two aircraft in a two-class layout, accommodating 105 passengers, flew with both Soviet and Japanese flight attendants. The aircraft proved to be extremely reliable. During the entire period of operation it didn't have a single serious accident due to technical reasons, for that time an amazing indicator. However, it was not completely without disasters. In February 1966 at Sheremetyevo airport the plane crashed while taking off. The cause of the disaster was an urgent takeoff in bad weather conditions at night from a runway that was not completely cleared of snow. The Tu-114 is a very reliable but demanding aircraft. Some higher-ups forgot about it. Another plane was lost in 1962, when during maintenance on the ground, technicians accidentally folded the nose landing gear and tumbled the aircraft onto concrete, severely damaging the fuselage. No one was hurt, but the case is tragically stupid. The Kuybyshev Aviation Plant produced the aircraft from 1957 to 1964. A total of 33 planes were made, 2 prototypes and 31 serial. Not a lot. Despite all the advantages of the Tu-114, its life was short. Ironically, the decisions that made it possible to speed up its creation led to its short service. The aircraft was created in the minimal time through the use of bomber solutions, but over the next decade these solutions quickly became outdated. Turboprop engines were powerful, economical and reliable, but jet engines quickly caught up with them in these regards, being much more comfortable in terms of noise and vibration levels. In addition it became clear that the concept of such a large turboprop airliner was a dead end in itself. When people see a propeller, they equate it with old piston aircraft, but it's one thing when it comes to a small regional plane, and quite another when it's the flagship of the country's fleet. The new time brought new long-range aircraft, more pragmatic and efficient, and in the USSR it was the Il-62. The Tu-114 quickly began to yield air routes to it, and by the mid-1970s when the time came for serious maintenance and upgrades it was decided that these measures were too complicated and wouldn't justify themselves. It also made no sense to modify the giants into something else. The fleet was full of other, more optimal machines, and the only brother of the airliner was the Tu-126, an airborne early warning and control aircraft. 
In the end, by 1977, the operation of the Tu-114 was completed. In subsequent years, most of the aircraft were scrapped, but some went to pedestals and museums. The very first Tu-114 arrived in Monina and is basking in the local sunshine to this day. On this, our big story about a big plane ends. Thanks to the Central Air Force Museum in Monina and its volunteer team for preserving this unique aircraft. And you aviation fans, like and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to watch the videos early, see some exclusive behind the scenes content or just support the channel, consider joining our Patreon community. Fast flights and soft landings to you.